I got to start the recording because I've forgotten it before. Uh, yeah, there's about five of us that kind of get together every Friday morning and many Wednesday morning and try to go out together. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. It's it's very fun. It's nice it's, to have a group of guys my age to sort of do something fun with. You know, we kind of lose that, get married, have kids. I didn't have kids, but. Yeah. So this yeah. is where Rob normally he reads you your rights. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I better get that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, John, the formal intros. Uh, John, just so you're aware, mm -hmm. anything you say can and will be twisted to be used against you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fair, I guess. Uh, and the names have been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Uh, for the for the I didn't listen, I listened to part of your uh, talk with Tanel, but I didn't listen to the whole thing, so I don't seem relatively benign. So I'll trust you guys. <laughs> what? Well, I have in the past gone back and edited out things that could get us canceled. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to be good on that score. Sometimes I. Usually, it's me. I get. <laughs> uh, i won't mention it because then rob will have to uh, edit it out but oh oh and yesterday i made you know you're uh, recording right don't say anything you uh, have to edit out <laughs> well and i don't have to edit this out yesterday i made uh ribs the type that take about five hours to make mm. and i made too many of them so i took them over to my neighbors to say hey you know you guys want some ribs and that was the first time in her life she had had fall off the bone ribs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> nice experience. She didn't tell you she was a vegetarian. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Roger, you want to do your intro? Because uh, yeah, we, can, we can get started. Um, actually, I haven't met uh, John uh, directly. Um, uh, yeah. I uh, I noticed, uh, you know, after we did the Tanel interview that he, um, or I guess maybe we were getting ready for it, and and he made some uh, comments about Tanel not having a gray beard and, <laughs> uh, and being in diapers and that type of thing when uh, when JB was getting started. And then with uh, V dollar table, yeah, it was something about V dollar tables, right? And it was like, yeah, I did a presentation on V dollar tables back in like uh, uh, late nineties. It was the first one where I, you know, I was working at Savant and, uh, and we had a product that was doing Oracle diagnostic stuff. And we had a lot of queries to collect data from V dollar tables as part of this product, you know, this uh, diagnostic tool that we had. And, uh, and so one of the first presentations I started doing at user groups, and it really it's actually the reason it sticks in my mind is because it's kind of the presentation that got me over being afraid to speak in front of, you know, audiences and do presentations because I gave it like 20 times, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, after the first couple of times, you kind of get, you know, you kind of realize, yeah, people are going to like it. There's no reason to be afraid. And uh, if you stumble on the slide, nobody gives a crap. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> so I got really comfortable doing presentations from this one. And it was called Probing for Problems in V Dollar Tables. <laughs> that was the name of my presentation. Uh, and that was probably 1997 or 1990s. 96 or seven i think i gave it at the east coast oracle conference and ah. maybe, uh, some other ones yeah yeah east coast oracle is uh one of my favorite because i'm here in north carolina so they uh hold it in north carolina the past maybe 12 years in a row uh, yeah back in the early days i did a couple of talks there that got the outstanding speaker award oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah two well, years let's, let's, two different let's, let's, years let's, let me do the intro and then yeah, yeah, sure. and we'll get started. So this way, folks will have a, a form, some formal knowledge, I suppose, of you. But uh, I just wanted to thank the audience for joining us on this uh, special episode of Graybeards. Uh, we're recording on June 6th, uh, 2023, which is the 79th anniversary of the day uh, mm -hmm. invasion. I know uh, Rob has been to uh, 
Normandy, and he has some uh, military folks in his uh, family history. So uh, just wanted to recognize those uh, people for uh, their efforts in in uh, helping establish freedom <laughs> and maintain freedom. It seems like a hard thing these days. Uh, but anyway, the vision behind Greybeards is to create a space for mentorship and exchange of ideas and perhaps a few war stories along the way. We're excited to welcome John Brzezenowicz uh, to our uh, podcast where we explore the experiences and his experiences and insights. Uh, and uh, so stay with us as we delve into his uh, fantastic journey and uh, extract some valuable <laughs> lessons from and his technical expertise. And perhaps we'll get some uh, war stories along the way. But uh, John is a respected Oracle performance management expert, and he has over 20 years experience in product design and architecture, and especially along the lines of observability and making um, uh, performance metrics accessible to uh, your ordinary DBA. Uh, he is a co-founder of a company a while back that uh, did this type of thing, and he's also a co-author of several uh, software engineering books, and he holds multiple patents in performance analytics and data visualization. Uh, he is a sought after speaker uh, for his knowledge on various uh, performance management topics, such as active session history, uh, automated workload repository, active uh, average active sessions, top activity, uh, and then ADDM and more. And he has a passion for delivering uh, results uh, to, and has a wealth of experience. So please join us as we welcome uh, JB to the podcast. Well, welcome. thanks for that. Uh, John, uh, I know we've met somewhere and I can't place it, but do you prefer John or JB? Uh, you know, people at Oracle call me JB because that's sort of the handle I got when I when I got there, probably because that's how I just sort of sign my emails, you know, <laughs> but you can call me JB or, or John. I think inside Oracle, I'm only JB, but outside Oracle, I'm kind of John or JB, right? So it's a, it's OK either way. OK. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, I've been to Normandy a couple of times. Uh First time I was there at the American Cemetery, uh, mm -hmm. I had the privilege of folding the flag at TAPS um, because I'm a veteran. Uh, second time I was there, I took my mom, who was uh, in the Navy in the 1950s. Wow. And uh, it, it's an incredibly moving place. And if you ever go there, how they did it, I have no clue. It is just amazing. So it's a it's a very moving and amazing place. Mm -hmm. So, JB, I have one two things. When I, okay. I I'm not a performance expert, I'm a security expert. Okay. But I do do a little bit of performance work, and I learned one rule in performance work, and only one rule. Yep. If you don't need to do it, don't do it. <laughs> well that's and a good that, that's a good rule right i mean it, you know performance is about doing work uh, and how much time it takes to do work right usually mm -hmm. but if you don't have to do the work at all that's zero time right so i mean you can't get better than zero time so i i agree with that that philosophy but of course stuff has to get done right so you can't get away with doing nothing for long although uh <laughs> You know, I've probably put that to the test a few times, but uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you yeah. guys go, but I mean, so the, your your intro was funny, right? So I, yeah, I I see you kind of lifted some stuff from here and there. My LinkedIn, you know, it says twenty years experience, right? Well, when I joined Oracle, <laughs> when I joined Oracle in two thousand and two. Uh -huh. I had 20 years experience then, right? So, okay. yeah, yeah. So, but you know, but I, before I rejoined, I rejoined Oracle in 2019 and I had left and uh, for a startup, you know, kind of got excited about a startup and it didn't work out. And then I was on the job market. You don't want to have your LinkedIn, you know, profile say like, you know, 35 years of experience, right? It was bad enough to be 20, right? So, uh, anyway, so, you know, you know only went back 20 years 
Actually, I was thinking I should, this is something I thought of recently. I should probably fill out my LinkedIn since I'm not really going to be looking for another job. Uh, <laughs> fill out my LinkedIn profile all the way back to 1982 when I first put on a suit and tie and started working at an insurance company, you know, just as a kind of a career tombstone, you know, it's like, okay, here lies John Bereznovich, uh, 40 years in the trenches. Takes a lot of work, though. Yeah, <laughs> 40 right. years in the trenches, and here it is, right? I, I gave up my suit in 1994. I had a sob, mm. and North Carolina had an exceptionally hot summer, and uh, the air conditioner broke in my sob, so I had to commute to work in the hot oh. in the hot summer. And I said, "Forget it. That's it. No more, <laughs> no, no more, more suit." suit. So, yeah, so, 1994. <laughs> yeah, no. I used to have a closet full of suits and have to go to the dry cleaner all the time and blah blah blah. You know, insurance companies are very conservative. I was a, I was an actuarial okay. student. I was a, you know, sort of a math guy in college. And my my wife is a CPA and a CFE. Mm, okay. And she de and she describes actuaries as accountants without a personality. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but you know, it, it's a tough road to get to be a fully. Uh, I forget what the full thing is, but they, you know, they pass a series of exams, like ten exams, and then you're kind of like on easy street in the insurance industry. You kind of, you know, kind of got it made, but it's a very difficult uh, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't cotton to it very much at all. So, but it's very uh, metrics driven, right? The actual. Yeah. yeah, it's all statistics. It's all basically, you know, computing life. If it's if it's life insurance, it's about matching life. You know, it's basically about uh, computing. Well, lots of things, but you know, it's all survives uh, about survivability and, uh, and and premiums and reserves. You know, how much do we have to keep in reserve in order to make sure that all these people we insured at all these various ages with all these various diseases will be able to get paid out whatever they're going to claim, and we can still have a pile to go make money with over here. Right? That's so what reserve. That's what reserve calculation is all about. You know, how much can we keep for ourselves and go fiddle with right so I can anyway see yeah was, uh, discovered v dollar metrics then uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The actuarial skills to work <laughs> yeah yeah well it's you know i actually you know they study things like operations research a lot of statistics stuff and, uh, and but it's all sort of about mortality and morbidity and at the at the root of it right <laughs> the the statistics you're dealing with are kind of about somewhat and then there's casualty insurance, which is about car accidents and earthquakes and probabilities of forest fires or whatever. Yeah, I remember when yeah. I bought my airplane, the uh, and it was a high performance complex. That's what the FAA classified it as. And the insurance company treated me like a 16 year old with a Corvette for the first 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have an airplane? Yeah. That's yeah. pretty wild. Never made yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, 1948 Ryan Navion. Uh, wow. That's kind of like an antique. It's not like a a little commuter, no, lady, right? That's like no. A, it's it, it's my my girlfriend, my mistress. My wife calls it that bitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell them how where do you fly flight. out of? Where do you fly out of? Uh, just northeast of Baltimore, uh, airport called Martin State Airport. And you ever okay. hear of a company called Lockheed Martin? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, that's where the Martin comes that's from. That's their private airport or something? No, uh, no, airport. no, 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 no. No, it's uh, Martin used to build their airplanes at, during World War II there. Mm. Seaplanes, warplanes, attack planes, etc. Wow. And so it's Martin Airport, and they have a nice collection of uh, air, uh, old airplanes there too. So do you like fly in air shows and stuff? I sh I show it at air shows, uh, static display. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, on the ground. Yeah, just sit it on the ground because to get certified by the FAA to fly in air shows and to get paid for it and all the associated maintenance. It's, mm, do yeah, I really want to do that? Yeah, do I really want to do that? 
<laughs> so I, I got you wanted to, you'd know it, right? You'd be into oh, it. If I want, yeah. Like right now I'm in the process of uh, waxing it, which is an all week affair. Wow. So, uh, yeah. It's a big airplane. Uh, and there's a lot of area to wax. Like yesterday I spent three hours waxing one wing. Man. So that's kind of wild. That's dedication. Tell them, tell them how much a spark plug costs, Rob. Uh, spark plugs are about 50 bucks each <laughs> wow so That's maintenance crazy. maintenance is you know pretty serious um yeah and i describe it every year as a college education it's either the community college or it's harvard law school and i've had <laughs> two years that were harvard law school and i really don't like a whole lot of those <laughs> this is your analogy for taking care of your pain yeah harvard, harvard law school or the community college isn't you it know, like yeah. uh, uh it should be like an engineering school not a law school okay all right uh, <laughs> mit it's mit M mit or university of richmond um <laughs> virginia <laughs> tech but yeah it can so you, get very... you live in the baltimore area huh we lived there for yeah. a number of years yeah, I'm just across the, just south of uh, Baltimore's Inner Harbor, just across the Key Bridge. Yeah, I worked at, uh, I worked in the, uh, downtown, my second job ah. after the 1982 insurance company. I worked at, and this is how I got into computer stuff, really, was, uh, so my first job was at a Provident Mutual in uh, in Philadelphia in 1982. I worked there for like four years. In 1986, I got, I got, I didn't like the insurance, the actuarial thing. I didn't do so great on one of the exams. It was like, why bother studying? There's, the study is actually pretty hard. It's rigorous. Anyway, it wasn't interesting. So I got, I applied for jobs and I got a job at American Health and Life Insurance Company as a kind mm -hmm. of systems analyst. Uh, and and uh, they were in Baltimore on St. Paul Street. Okay. Right down by, you know, Inner Harbor, you could go for lunch, right? Mm -hmm. It was very low key back then, but it was still nice, but it was very low key. Now I think it's way, you know, over the top probably. But this was 86 or something. Yeah, and, I, I take, uh, my, I take yeah. my boat into the Inner Harbor frequently for happy hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, at the insurance company, we had uh, COBOL programs and uh, all the actuarial students had one or more decks that they were responsible for. Like at year end and quarter end, they would run big programs, COBOL programs to calculate reserves and premiums, things like that. And, uh, and you know, so everybody had their COBOL deck in there. That was like my first exposure to programming. I didn't really do much programming in COBOL, but we did we did have a little uh, sort of tape driven sort of not a PC because it was a shared thing you had to go use it and then everybody else could use it, it wasn't like your own private thing. But it was you know it used tape and I think we programmed that in in, uh, in basic or something but the but they also used a lot of APL and so on the timeshare systems they you know sort of the more you know, not the uh, not the batch COBOL decks, but the mm -hmm. they did have sort of some timeshare stuff. They 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 would uh, there was APL programs, so that was an interesting wacky language. I never got any good at it. Very strange. But then when I went to <clears throat> this place in Baltimore, so I left the insurance company in Philly. I met my wife there. Um, we weren't husband and wife at the time, but. Uh, we moved down to Baltimore and I took this job at American Health and Life. And uh, that was kind of interesting, but I was a systems analyst and, but I it was in the insurance area, right? So I understood insurance industry and, and, uh, and we used to program, uh, we had this, uh, you know, the records, the, the automated systems were on these um, sort of 
file system, you know, files that were variable number of variable length records, right? So each file would be kind of like, you know, the string of policies and addendums to policies that some policy holder had, right? And you can have infinitely many combinations of things in, in insurance, you know, there's like, you know, this rider and that special thing and whatever. And these things were all, you know, individual record types that were then strung together. And, you know, so, so it was a variable number of variable length chunks. And each chunk was sort of like, you know, the data for this policy addendum or this policy feature, right? And so we had to traverse these things in this program. We use this programming language called DYL260, D-Y-L hyphen 260. And it was very strange, but it was kind of like a parameterized assembler code. You know, you would do branches and things like that, but it was a lot easier to do than assembler code. I had done a little bit of assembler code and that was just sort of very cryptic. And this stuff you could kind of sort of see, you know, you could sort of follow the logic better. It was kind of like, but it was very much, you know, compare branch, compare branch. And, uh, and so we used to traverse this variable length, you know, variable number of variable length records data structure by basically going to the start of it. And every record said how long it was, right? So you'd go to the start of it and you'd find out whether it was one of the ones you're interested in or not. And if it wasn't, you figure out, you find out how long it was and jump to the next one and then say, is this one of the ones I'm looking for or not? If it is, you need to go inspect the fields. If it's not, you jump over the next. That's how we used to do this thing, right? It was very much like kind of uh, writing your own index, uh, you know, traversal or something. But um, yeah, dial 260, that was kind of a trip. Yeah. yeah, and then from there I went to, uh, that was an interesting job. And there's sort of a, a, a funny history about that job, which is that um, that company, which is, is a, it, was a, it was part of a conglomerate of financial services companies that was owned by Control Data Corporation. If you remember that company. Yeah. <laughs> and they had this little side business with these four kind of financial services. There was our insurance company and there was some commercial lending business and there was something else. Anyway, long story short, the the these uh, these Wall Street guys uh, convinced Control Data to spin off that that company and let them take it you know take it private, you know for a certain amount of money, whatever they put in, right? And that was uh, uh, that eventually became Citicorp. <laughs> Interesting. If you can believe that, the guys, the, the Wall Street guys that engineered this deal with Control Data were Sandy Weil and uh, Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon's now, you hear about him on CNBC every day, right? He's like the biggest banker in the world right now. But but anyway, they they spun off this little financial services conglomerate and then proceeded to basically gobble up larger and larger and larger companies until they finally merged with City or Citibank. And became Citicorp, and uh, you know, it was pretty funny. So, as part of that whole thing, you know, people people uh, that were at the company when this this operation took place, you know, sort of had to make decisions about whether they were going to stay or go or whatever, right? And and I actually remember being in the in the office with Jamie Dimon discussing my future at the company, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, at one point, you know, sitting across the desk from the guy, right. So that's sort of an interesting, uh, close, close yeah, yeah. encounter with eventual fame and fortune, right? But yeah, I've never met Jamie Dimon, but I can tell from <laughs> interviews two things: one, he is extraordinarily intelligent, and two, he does not suffer fools. Yeah, I I can't say that I've met him, but I can. But when he he was a young whippersnapper protege of Sandy Weil at the time, he was sort of oh. freshly freshly minted out of Harvard MBA or something like that. You know, he wasn't, he hadn't been in the world, in the, in the real world for too long at that point. So it's sort of interesting. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So from there, I guess, you know, I mean, I had a lot of jobs, not a lot, but you know, a fair number, especially for those times from there, I ended up um, 
taken a job at Continental Insurance and it was much more, it was sort of a bigger insurance company. And uh, so I didn't feel comfortable with this whole takeover by these New York guys, who knows what's gonna happen. So I went out and got a job somewhere. And we were going to go move to Jersey. And there I actually started getting exposure to relational databases a little bit um, uh, on IBM systems, SQL DS, I think it was. Oh, we're going yeah, back. But that away. job was, yeah, that job only lasted for like three months. And I was back in Baltimore looking for work and got work at, um, as a contractor at DuPont. Mm. And DuPont had a small division uh, in the fibers department. DuPont's a sort of huge company, has different big chunks of it. And one was fibers. And under fibers, there was a small operation that was kind of operating like a little startup. And it was called Information Engineering Associates. And they were basically trying to use the kind of what was popular and this is the mid late 80s right so or uh you know yeah mid late 80s they were trying to use case tools to sort of quickly create systems you know by basically you know specifying data models and other things and then just pushing a button and have an application spit out the back end right that was something that people thought could happen at one time and uh and that was, and that, so as part of that group, we had a little software engineering methodology that had a funny acronym RIP, you know, it was a rapid develop prototyping development methodology, you know, now everything's agile, but before that there was other kind of versions of how to do things better, faster or whatever. And we had one of those that we would use when we would go to clients and so we started evaluating some of these new case tools and we uh, were looking at oracle forms like basically oracle database and, and, and oracle forms as a platform for doing these rapid software development efforts and i was one of the first guys they sent to oracle training to, to check that thing out so that's where i kind of got involved in the, the real relational database stuff and Oracle and that was version five. And that's what we were trained on at that time. So that was probably late eighties, I guess. That and would be I, about the time that yeah, uh, and I, I started you know, in Oracle. Yeah, and I was a I mean, I was sort of a math guy and you know, relational databases, I mean, uh they actually have a very uh solid mathematical foundation, as we know, right? So set theory and you know, relational theory. So, but and then at that time, you know, we used to, I mean, I used to read Chris Date books, you know, kind of religiously, you know, and uh, we we would argue about data models and normal forms and, you know, was was it better to put this attribute over here, over there? And, uh, you know. I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to get Chris Date on a uh, future Graybeards podcast. Uh, yeah, he's a real Graybeard, I guess. Yeah, he's yeah, been he was, for a um, while. Well, he came, uh, he came on the radar screen and the person I'm in contact with, uh, uh, I tried or trying to get his, his contact information. So he, I guess right now he's a little secretive about his contact information. So it's right, hard, right. Well, hard, I think, hard, I don't know. Uh, I don't know him. I've seen him uh, do lectures a couple of times, but 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 back then, you know, he was writing all of these, uh, you know, books about SQL and the relational model and all this. And I was gobbling those up. I was always at Borders trying to find the next, you know, good book about that stuff. I took a class um, from Chris State, a uh, oh, one really? week class. class, and that was like a PhD level class that you know after 30 minutes my brain would be hurting i yeah yeah just he's pretty think, rigorous yeah he's pretty yeah rigorous. yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the class i took with him was object relational uh class and that was in boston i think maybe like it was probably like early 90s i would say oh yeah. really object relational back then <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. interesting that's something going on with my eye that's why i'm rubbing it well, John, I wanted to say that I've been a long follower of your work and, and oh. 
and you have an <laughs> impressive track record of making um, metrics available to the ordinary DBA, but I'm also especially impressed um, with your recent work on the ADDM Spotlight tool. So ah, was, yeah, you were, at, you were at the recent uh, talk we did. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could just briefly describe for our audience ADDM, and can you tell us what you liked about uh, or best about uh, working on the ADDM Spotlight and, and adding that to Oracle's observability products? Well, uh, so I guess one of the reasons, uh, just to answer your last question first, is because uh, one of the most satisfying things about it is that, you know, my boss uh, has been asking for this for like 10 years, right? So, so this isn't a new idea, but it's been finally executed. And it was always a good idea. So it's nice to kind of finally, um, I mean, things, you know, at a big company with a lot of product and a lot of competing interests for developers and things, it can, be, it can take a while before a good idea materializes in front of the customer, you know, so... But the Atom, you know, Atom, I think, you know, we ADDM is automatic database diagnostic monitor. And, and it came out as kind of one of the, uh, you know, came in, in, in Oracle database 10G, one of the main themes uh, and da database 10G came out, what, in 2020? I mean, in the 2002 or three timeframe, basically right when I joined Oracle, I joined in order to, uh, uh, to join a group that was dedicated to exposing database manageability features through Enterprise Manager and, uh, and, and also we, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of DB Express or whatever it was called. But, but, uh, but as far as ADDM goes, it was really kind of the, the pinnacle of the database manageability stuff. So it was, you know, it's an expert system that incorporates, you know, just a lot of depth and breadth of Oracle knowledge, you know, some of our best Oracle internal uh, uh, experts uh, with, you know, hundreds of man years, person years of, of, uh, of deep experience built into it. But it's basically an old school AI system. And when I say old school, I mean, the old days, expert systems were the AI systems, right? And they were basically mm -hmm. just you know, rules-based systems that captured the expertise of the best minds in some field or other, right? And so that's what ADDM was, is an expert system, rules-based, capturing the, you know, the, the, the best performance analysis, Oracle performance analysis of, of all the experts, right? And ADD, but, you know, ADDM, uh, is is also you know basically takes a very almost exclusively db time oriented approach to analyzing performance and of course that's really was the main thrust of the whole manageability effort was to part of it at least was to formalize db time as the performance metric that we're interested in the most right and and to provide tools and an expert Expert system to help customers optimize their DB time, which from a performance point of view really usually means shrink the DB time, do the same work, you've improved performance, right? So AD, ADDM is basically this rule-based system that's designed to go out and apply this kind of DB time analysis to AWR snapshots. And ADDM is really kind of, and, and so it comes up with all kinds of things that are called findings, which are really statements about DB time. And then for each finding, it may or may not come up with a recommendation or more, more than one recommendation. And what rec recommendations are associated with specific findings and recommendations are things you might do that could shrink this piece of DB time that I'm talking about, right? So recommendations try to tell you how to reduce the DB time of the findings. That's kind mm -hmm. of, the, in a nutshell, what Adam is, is, is about. And of course, these rules are all about analysis, you know, analyzing weight classes and looking at SQLs and all kinds of other measures and things that tell, you know, latch stuff, whatever. Uh, anyway, so Adam is really intended to be kind of like the crown jewel, you know, but yeah. 
I mean, not many people seem to use Adam. And that's sort of been, you know, sort of frustrating, I think, for us. And now, you know, every once in a while, some super expert comes up with a whole bunch of things that Adam got wrong, right? And okay, well, you know, it's not perfect. Nothing is, right? Especially, uh, but it's still it's nice to have sort of an an AI expert system looking at your 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 performance data 24/7 and making recommendations about things you can do, right? Now, the original design is really kind of every every hour an AWR snap by default, every hour an AWR snapshot is generated and then Adam goes to work on that data, right? The AWR snapshot is like a giant boatload of performance data. And that's what Adam sifts through and figures out what he figures out. So, and so every hour of every day, Adam is taking a look at the last hour. As soon as the snapshot finishes, Adam goes to work, right? So every day at the end of an hour, Adam is looking at what happened that hour, right? Well, that's nice. And it's really good if there was like a big performance problem during one hour, you go look at the atom, you know, you look, you find the atom run closest to the performance problem. And that's probably going to give you a lot of data, you know, insight into that problem. Because atom, you know, it runs every hour. And so whenever you have a problem, there can't be an atom run too far, along, you know, too far away. Right. So, but that's a very tactical thing. Right. And so any given atom recommendation is, is still only a, a based on one hour of activity, right? And so that's a pretty tactical point of view right now. But these things are happening 24 seven, right? And so what, uh, what my boss, uh, uh, Carl Dias, uh, w was always fond of calling the report of reports, right? So Adam gives you a report about an AWR snapshot. But what Carl was always saying was, well, we need to do the report of reports, which he was really saying, we need to aggregate multiple reports together to have a bigger picture, right? And so that idea goes back a long ways. And, you know, when I, I came back to Oracle, they were thinking, they were talking about it again. And, uh, and I got involved in that. And so we put together a decent, um, a decent spec and the, and, the, and the enterprise manager team implemented the, the, the Adam Spotlight. And, uh, and so basically what it does is it just aggregates Adam findings and recommendations over longer periods of time. And it computes some very basic uh, aggregates over those, right? The aggregates being, you know, on a per finding basis or a per recommendation basis, the frequency that it occurred, right? So if you have a week's worth of, if you say, you know, tell me what happened last week, the Adam Spotlight, right? It'll be looking at 168 atom runs, each of which can have multiple findings and recommendations, right? And it'll aggregate those and tell you for each of them, each distinct finding or recommendation, how many times it occurred. So that's the frequency, right? What is the overall benefit? What's that? Well, it's the overall it's the total amount of DB time expressed as average active sessions uh, compared to the total overall load over the time period. So it's really the percentage of DB time that this, that this finding or recommendation uh, concerns. And then there's the max benefit, right? Or max impact. So findings, findings have impact and, benefit, and uh, recommendations have benefit but both of them are measures of DB time, right? So the impact is the amount of DB time a finding is uh, have a footprint on, and the benefit is the amount of DB time that a recommendation might save you, right? But both of those, we compute these aggregates over. So the max benefit or the max impact is really the maximum percent of the load within an AWR snapshot. So that's really saying, you know, this finding occurred, you know, maybe the frequency is, you know, 10 out of 168, right? And the average benefit is, okay, on an aggregate, you know, the sum of all the benefits divided by the sum of all the load, you know, what's the percentage there? The max benefit is, okay, within any given snapshot where this finding or recommendation occurred, you know, what of, of all of those, which one was it the most of its time slot, right? So that's kind of looking at, you know, like, 
if a if a so the, so the kind of decisions or the the sort of the the inputs into um, uh, decision making are are you know does this happen all the time? And that's the frequency, right? Or does this happen on a regular basis? We actually have a little time. We, you can see kind of when certain findings happen, so you can see whether there's sort of a noticeable pattern over time or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the max benefit, the overall benefit is really like, you know, how much am I going to get for this overall, right? The max benefit is, you know, well, hey, how much is this going to help me when it really helps me? And if that's the most important hour of the day, well, then maybe that raises, the, elevates the importance of, you know, addressing the finding or whatever. And so what um, we like to say is that it kind of takes these tactical findings and aggregates them up and to, gives you a much more strategic perspective. So, you know, if Adam is saying, uh, you know, hey, you need to add CPUs, well, you know, that can be costly. It can be take a lot of effort, right? It takes some decision making. It's not a light decision, right? So how much DB time are we talking about, right? How much do CPUs cost, right? Are there any other things I can do? Well, okay, this, this SQL actually is using most of the CPUs. So maybe you ought to go tune that first before you go buy CPUs. So Adam Spotlight lets you really kind of weigh overall costs, overall benefits, uh, you know, of different options and make more st sort of strategic decisions about performance uh, changes that are designed to optimize performance. So it sort of moves out of the tactical sort of DevOps orientation and, and brings Adam uh, into a more strategic uh, kind of uh, use case. And I think it's going to be great. I like it actually. When I first started looking at it, and it's not that fancy or anything, it's really, you know, just a time series of when findings are happening and then uh you know uh lists with these aggregates you know and you know ordered by overall benefit or something um yeah the uh one of the pages that i liked was um where you overlaid uh the addm findings with events like parameter changes yeah uh, oh that's a nice little ad that's actually pretty recent but it's actually very mm -hmm. nice yeah you can so see now it. do they does that support um overlaying with uh customer you know like custom events so uh, for example if uh not right now. No, we just look. Actually, all the only thing we look for right now is database restarts and uh, and parameter changes, which of course you know they're important from the perspective of Adam findings, right, and recommendations. Because uh, quick yeah. quick question on Adam, and I haven't tested this, so I you you can probably prove me uh, wrong. Uh, if Adam comes and says add a bitmap index to put, uh, improve select, but later on in another hour, a week later, someone's doing a lot of updates on that bitmap index, which is a performance hog. Does Adam look at the cost? You know, we've improved performance, but we have a major performance hit here. I mean, does it actually uh, tie uh, uh, an action you took to a few, you know, to to future Adam findings, not really. I mean, in other words, it doesn't go back and say, oh, you took this recommendation, you made it better. But, you know, we would expect to see that in the change in findings, right? So you would, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if, if, if you, you know, if you looked at Adam and made a change to some parameter because Adam said that that'll help you with, I don't know, some aspect of query processing. I mean, certainly you would hope to see that finding kind of disappear or reduce, right? If mm -hmm. not, then that's a kind of a problem. And then, you know, maybe others do too. I don't know, you know, maybe some sequels that used to be in the top sequels no longer are because they're, you know, they're taking advantage of whatever this parameter change was or something. So you would expect to notice in the change, you know, perhaps in the sort of the change in, in findings and recommendations after a change that you know you made than before, but Adam doesn't sort of track that or anything like that. Okay. On its own. Yeah. It, you it, just have it, to be yeah. you, you have to be smart enough to say, I made this change, it improved yeah. this, but it degraded this. Yeah. But of course, you know, I mean, we do have tools and, and we have tools for doing precisely what you're talking about, right? So 
you know, uh, SQL performance analyzer and, you know, the real application testing tools, right? SQL performance analyzer and, mm -hmm. and also the database replay. You know, that's all about sort of like seeing what happens to your workload when you make a certain change and, and then before you make the change, right? So it's sort of, those tools are designed specifically kind of for that scenario, like how much is this going to fix this problem? Um, they're complicated. I mean, SPA is also another kind of underused tool, I think. And probably the reason is, I think the reason my theory is that it's because it's kind of tightly coupled with database replay, which is a very, it's a very pricey thing. So only mm -hmm. the customers that really have the, the database replay use case kind of can additionally use SPA. So it'd be nice if that wasn't the case. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... Uh... Is that part of real application testing? So that has to be licensed separately? Yeah, yeah, the SPA, yeah. I've, I've lobbied internally for them to be separated, but I, it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, things are complicated all the time. <laughs> so, so John, uh, um, you've established a lot of friendships along the way in your career. So Graham Wood, Kerry Osborne, yeah. Janelle, Poder, and others. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the concept behind the term iron sharpens iron. So what would you say <laughs> to others or our audience to encourage them to establish and maintain such uh, relationships? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, the, the the relationships that I'm, you know, I mean, the, that I feel closest to, I guess, are the people that I've worked on what I think are kind of important or important to me projects you know so like Kyle and I worked together on you know Kyle and Gaja and even James Morrill a little bit we sort of four were hired in way back in 2002 to, to, to sort of work on this database manageability stuff in the EM um, you know we, we did the top activity the perf page you know lots of the but, you know, Kyle and I worked together uh, with Gaja and James on the perf page and the drill downs that became the basis for the top activity page. And that, you know, that was, that was a super important thing. I mean, that like, people still want it. You know, they're unhappy with that. They're unhappy that we kind of went, went exclusively with perf hub and dropped the old EM top activity page. Um, but because it was just so uh, very useful to, for folks. Um, you know, and Graham and I, you know, really Graham, you know, my relationship with him is kind of, he's really a mentor to me, but, you know, he's also a close personal friend at this point, but, you know, we did a lot together. Um, I mean, he really was the architect behind, uh, one of the principal architects. There actually were multiple very high level architects from Oracle involved in database manageability, but Graham was sort of the the father of DB time, if you will. And uh, so I just learned a ton from Graham and, you know, uh, you know, it was just, uh, but, but he of course was heavily involved in our work on uh, the EM side of things because we were basically exposing his babies uh, <laughs> to the world, right? So he was involved in a lot of those meetings uh, and discussions. Uh, so yeah, you know, I have a friend Amir who we worked on some stuff. Uh, he went to Google very early, but the first couple of years at Oracle, we worked on some things, adaptive threshold stuff, and you know, I still uh, that you know. Uh, so I think a lot of it is basically you know working hard on 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 projects with people that sort of got me close to people. Now Tanel and Carrie, I know them kind of from the circuit, you know, the Oracle circuit um the speaking circuit if you will mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um mostly oh and also the oak table i guess that's really how i know those guys so i was at this sort of meeting in denmark that happened in something like february or january of 2000 maybe 2001 it was some kind of, uh, it was a symposium, so-called, I guess, at Mons Norgard's house in Denmark. And a uh, bunch You'll of people were there. I think it was Jonathan Lewis was doing the presentation, uh, but Steve Adams was there, Lex DeHaan. 
uh, Anya Culp, James, I think Stefan Haley was there. Sure, uh, even staff. A bunch of guys from Europe, you know, a bunch of the guys from uh, Miracle that work for Moans or with Moans uh, at, at Miracle. Um, James Morrill. And so we were all at Jonathan's thing and we were hanging out at, at, at Moans' house and, uh, and all, you know, using hard wires connected to some router. Uh, you know, it was all hard wires, right? There was no Wi-Fi. And so, and it was this big oak table where everybody's laptop and all connected up with these wires. And somebody coined the phrase, you know, oh, it's the oak table network, you know, because it's <laughs> big network sitting on top of an oak table. And, so yeah, that's where that little group, that sort of group was sort of conceived then. And of course it grew into uh, a lot of, uh, a, lar a much larger group of, of people, but there's been some connections made through that, through that group too, I guess. Um, but I haven't made it a policy to be very, uh, I'm not a very social outgoing sort of network guy. So I'm not sort of trying to get a lot of followers or you know, LinkedIn connections. Um, anyway, yeah, no, it's been, I mean, uh, it's been great to know those people. Yeah, the second time I gave a talk, Graham Wood was sitting in the front row and I'm sitting <laughs> there and I'm going, no, why <laughs> you? That's if I mess this up, it yeah, it is. Especially if he raises his hand, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience. I, I presented at uh, Tribatus uh, Performance Days in Zurich uh, last year. Oh, and, last year. Okay. And Jonathan Lewis was in the audience of my presentation because I, I have a an, an anomaly detection mechanism that i developed for ah, uh, okay. metrics and and uh, i have a book on the topic and uh so jonathan lewis and of course uh, christian antagonini was there too he's the one who invited me to it so i'm, I'm thinking to myself okay he's the <laughs> he's got the bible on oracle performance and uh and jonathan lewis has a you know a great following and so forth so i was yeah. trembling a little bit <laughs> yeah no those are those guys are uh, superstars for sure uh -huh. Jonathan, of course, well, very well known. Oh yes, I I spoke at Travatis once many many years ago. Like I think it was one of the early Ash talks, maybe even average active sessions. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could share a memorable war story from your career where you faced a significant failure or setback. Uh, oh, and, this sounds like an interview question. And then how that experience was a driving force, you know, to, to be <laughs> driving great. force. Well, I set you up for that one, but I did. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, a setback, huh? Let's see. Setback. What was a good setback? Well, I don't know if it was a driving sense. force, but I, I, I was mortified when I kind of failed out of graduate school in math. You know, I went to, uh, I, I was a math major at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And um, I really admired my math professors. I thought they were just like super smart and, you know, they were proving things. And they were like geniuses. And so I thought, well, that's what I want to be. So I applied to graduate school and got in probably mostly on the strength of one of my faculty advisors who was a well-known topologist who I think had studied or taught at the University of Washington. Anyway, I managed to get in at the University of Washington and proceeded to do very poorly. Uh, you know, at Wesley and I was like, you know, the, we had a very small, there was maybe half a dozen math graduates, uh, math majors, you know, per class. And, uh, you know, I was, and, and everybody kind of got A's, right? Because you wouldn't do it if you weren't, you know, kind of capable of it in a way. So it wasn't a whole lot of, um dispersion of the of the and, but at, at the UW I was like struggling to be like mid-pack you know I mean there was just super genius people in there and professors would get up and just ramble on and write all kinds of inscrutable things on the board and I'd be struggling at night trying to figure out what the hell did they say 
So I wasn't I wasn't exactly that uh, cut out for that. But it was it was it was very uh, it was very difficult. But I ended up sticking. Out, I was in Seattle. That's where UW is, and it's beautiful out there. So I kind of fell in love with the West Coast when I was there. And and uh, and before just bailing out altogether, I know Roger. I think you have a background in forestry or something. But uh, I think I heard that the Tunnels thing, but. I switched uh, out of the math department because my dad had a former colleague at DuPont who was actually a professor at, in forest resources at the UW. Mm -hmm. And I had stayed with their family when I first went out to the uh, out to Seattle to, to look for an apartment and things. So I was, you know, he said, hey, you know, before just bailing on the graduate school altogether, why don't you come do some work with us for a while? So I spent about six or nine months as a associated with the department of forest resources and studying things like wood physics uh, wood physics wood physics yeah it's basically this it, there's a lot of uh i mean you know the capillary forces inside wood are tremendous mm -hmm. uh, and the movement of water in wood is something that people study a lot right because i don't know i guess for industry, they got to figure out how to kill and dry things so they don't warp and stuff. Or, you know, there's lots of, but it's a very, uh, you know, uh, inexact science, I guess, because mm -hmm. you know, you're basically studying this organic structure that's, high, you know, completely variable, right? But, you know, anyway, so, uh, that was sort of interesting. I still have a couple of books from back then, you know, just to sort of remind me, you know, water. My, my forestry, yeah. Uh war story was basically uh i was a second semester junior when i dropped out of the forestry program and then i did c construction work for about three years and i went back to school in 1980 for computer science and i had never actually seen a computer in my life <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, but then it took a while but I, it finally clicked and then once it clicked uh but i but i do remember my math class because i was um I had to retake, um, I had to uh, take multivariable calculus and, uh, and I went and I had only had like the, the baby calculus class in the forestry program. So I went straight into multivariable calculus and the professor was like in this cloud of dust, chalk dust. I mean, literally <laughs> <Chalk> dust. <laughs> he was doing integrations and, deriv and derivations or whatever. And <laughs> derivatives, literally a, a, a cloud of chalk dust. And I'm like writing things down and nothing made any sense and stuff like that. And I, and I like suffered in that class until like a day before the drop ad period. And I just said, I can't take others like <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna fail out. And, and then I, and then I went back and I said, let me just retake calculus, you know, the regular calculus, the four credit calculus. And then I'll take multivariable calculus. So I did that. I did okay. And then they dropped the uh, multivariable calculus from the curriculum. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's math is you know if you're going to get into math, you have to become comfortable with like uh, writing very fast. <laughs> well, no, not un well, not understanding stuff, and just sort of having faith that if you really apply yourself, eventually you will, right? Mm -hmm. so a, I mean, that was what amazed me about like some of the people at the UW, right? Like there was there was this one guy. He was sort of he was an undergrad, but he was taking graduate level classes with the grad students, and, and he would just sit in the back, like you know, look like he wasn't paying attention at all. And then he would correct the professor after he <laughs> he, he wrote something wrong on the board. I was like, Jesus Christ. The guy's following this guy in real time and then saying, no, you did it wrong. You know. Meanwhile, I'm just trying to write exactly what he wrote because I've got to study it that night and see if I can figure it out. So. Yeah, I had a math professor at uh, George Mason and he would start writing on one wall and then another wall and then another wall and when he got to the end of the third wall class was over and i'm sitting here <laughs> just as just as fast as i can write and you know i'm like oh, and i could never keep up with him and he's talking simultaneously explaining what he's doing and i'm like i cannot copy listen and process simultaneously yeah yeah i just can't do it so much easier now right you got cell phones in case they do the chalk thing you just take your cell phone out and click oh it, yeah right? 
I, I, I think I a lot did. of classes they they do like uh, you know notebooks and presentations or, or they send it yeah. or they send out the PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint. <laughs> But I have one forestry stuff. It wasn't studies. It was the best job I have ever had in my life. It didn't pay for crap. It was working with the Virginia Department of Agriculture, setting gypsy moth traps in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Oh, that sounds they nice. Would, they would drop you off at a trailhead in the morning. You'd pack your lunch and you'd set gypsy moth traps, you know, hiking all day, sit down around lunch time, eat your lunch, keep, and then they'd pick you up, you know, someplace you else. around a box full of these things? Like, yeah. How many of them do you have? A hundred? Oh, easily a hundred. Setting them, picking them up, it, you know, and <laughs> I did that for a summer and I loved it. It was just every day I went hiking. Yeah, right. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> well i'm ready for that you guys retired roger you're not retired are you not not yet not not quite uh i have a few years in me left maybe maybe we'll see the topic has come up though i had yeah. the retirement <laughs> planning uh uh meeting last year and uh, i really only had this my current job for a year um working with the center and tech group but any anyway um uh, we had the retirement planning and I thought it was going to be like, oh, when do you want to retire? But it was more like facts and figures, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, how, much, yeah. how much are you going to be able to generate or live here's on? What you, here's what you're allowed to spend if you retire now, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. And, but, and I am classifying myself as semi-retired. Semi-retired? Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to go into the whole long drawn out, but... I'm going to take the summer off. And if something really interesting comes up, I'll take it. Um, but I'm not going to get head down trying to find something until maybe September, mm -hmm. October. And then only if it's interesting and take short term projects. Oh, nice. And you can fly yeah. to it. <laughs> well, I have my airplane I have to take care of. I have my boat I have to take care of. I have two houses I have to take care of. Good guy. And when you and when you work full time, something has to give. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a lot of stuff. I got one yeah, for the, the current the current company that I'm uh, contracting with. They have uh, ten minute snapshot periods, which is nice because there's a lot of AWR data. Wow, that's really fast. It's a six. It's a six-node rack cluster, and each um, database has 144, or each cluster or node has 144 CPUs with uh, with some wow. something like um, 700 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> Why are they taking such frequent snapshots? Oh, just uh, you know, when things happen, you know, it gives you more granular data. Yeah. So I have worked with the with the one hour snapshots, but definitely the 10 minute snapshots uh, give you a lot more uh, granularity, I suppose you could say, for pinpointing problems. Do they uh, do they change the. Um, Retention period is 45 days. The downsampling, the ash downsampling. Um, you know, you can change that from one in 10 to like, you know, one in three. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't know that. Uh, no, they haven't. And not really recommended, but yeah, you can, and that way you'll have a lot more ash data in AWR. Yeah, the, one of the things I noticed yeah. was they, a lot of things get skipped in uh, SQL stat because you know it's only picking up the top two, let's say, two hundred SQL statements. So right, that's probably that's probably their one. Setting. So that's actually something that you might be interested in that I've I've been working on a lot lately, which is. Uh, in this operations insights service, um, we had we we have a feature called SQL Warehouse, and it was it was collecting sort of top SQLs and related plans and things, but it was really only collecting about a hundred every half hour, um, and it was using some Ash. It was using Ash um, to do some uh, some things that you know weren't always quite right. So, but 
you know, this concept of a SQL warehouse seems kind of pretty useful, right? Like uh, not just like maybe my top 10 or whatever, but, you know, a, a much more representative collection of SQL, like so that I can really maybe build a better picture of my whole workload, right? Um, not just the high load things, but what do the other things look like? And so we, we, we're collecting uh, in this operations insight service, now we collect um, up to 2,000 SQL IDs from SQL stats. And, you know, the rows from SQL stats for up to 2,000 SQL IDs uh, every half hour, right? And so, and the, the most active SQLs in the last half hour, right? So the way we, the way we kind of figure that out because SQL stats, you know, are all accumulators that start accumulating when the SQL is first sort of hard parsed and comes into the shared pool for the first time, right? So everybody's got a different starting line, right, for their metrics. That's kind of a problem, but there's actually some new fields in, in SQL stat, in V-dollar SQL stats that relate to, you know, how much has happened since the last AWR snapshot. These are so-called delta fields in SQL stats. So you have things like delta CPU and delta elapsed time and uh, delta IO stuff, right? Delta execution. And so that puts everybody on the same footing, right? The AWR snapshot happened at one time. And so everybody's delta, every all the SQL stat, all the SQL IDs, delta underscore this, that, the other thing columns are all being accumulated since the last AWR snapshot, which means everybody's kind of uh, logging their changes since then. Mm -hmm. So we only, so that's what we use as a sort of uh, uh, the basis for a ranking metric that we use to select the top 2000 by. You know? So anyway, I, I think it might be kind of interesting because it should have a lot larger coverage of the sequels that you ran. I mean, we really want to kind of be able to say, hey, you know, your workload looks like this, right? Not just your top sequels look like this. Um, Interesting. Uh, so that, yeah, so that's something you might actually, you know, look into. <laughs> we're, we're right now, it's only exposed through something we call SQL Explorer, which is, you know, one of these so-called data object explorers that we have, which kind of let you construct uh, sort of, uh, you know, by clicky, most, by a lot of clicky stuff, you can kind of easily construct fairly basic analytic SQL on top of some of these data sources that we have. So the, one of the first ones we did was the SQL stats stuff. Mm -hmm. So you said that was called SQL Warehouse? Well, it's under SQL Warehouse. I mean, right now the SQL Warehouse is the prod, is the product that, or this, the piece that looks at this ash extract, which is useful enough. It's actually not so useful for for low latency SQLs, like things under three or three or two or three seconds, but for higher latency SQLs, which are, you know, there's plenty of those, it does a pretty good job. Um, but but uh, right now the sort of the SQL stats collection is only visible through SQL Explorer, which is underneath SQL Warehouse in the, in the kind of the menu that we have. Um, this is OCI service. So that's kind of one, that's mostly what I've been working on. Well, I had them spotlight and, and then OCI service. So I haven't really done um, too much EM work since I've been back. I've been mostly trying to help uh, our group with, um, you know, OCI services. So. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So that's a nice story of about Spotlight, which is it was developed by the EM group, but it was very quickly ported to be part of our OCI service because they're using, you know, sort of the JET architecture for the UI and some other kind of conventions that made it, you know, quite easy to sort of move the technology, you know, from EM into the cloud. So that was kind of nice because, you know, the EM version was finished and a few months later, the OCI version was ready. You know, it was sort of very, very fast to see uh, Adam Spotlight kind of show up in two places. In, in fact, it was so fast that we basically, you know, had to sort of merge competing blog posts into a single blog post about both releases kind of thing. So, so yeah. So anyway, that, yeah, Adam Spotlight, I think, hopefully it'll have some traction with customers mm -hmm. and, and actually help people um, 
you know, in ways that, um, you know, are a little, I mean, you know, solving the big performance problem is a huge and important use case, but it's, it tends to be the only one we think about, right? I mean, I don't know how many meetings about, I mean, I don't know, every meeting you're in, you know, somebody said, well, the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, right? It's always the problem is, right? It's like, <laughs> I'm not only interested in like, you know, noodling out problems, right? I, I'm more, I'm also interested in just sort of, you know, the way things are, right? Not just like only problems, right? I mean, you know, yeah, if the house is on fire, you got to put the fire out, but I don't want to just have a fire hose looking for fires, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's other things in life, you know? Right. So a lot of what I'm interested in is just, you know, and this is really what we used to say at Savant, the startup that I was part of way back in the mid nineties, you know, we did an Oracle diagnostic tool for DBAs and, you know, our kind of catchphrase to kind of just characterize, you know, uh, the use case that we wanted to deliver on was really, you know, what's going on in the database. You know, you got this Oracle database, a very complex machine, and it's like a black box, you know, it's just like you stuff SQL in and the answers come back, you know, maybe, maybe not, you know, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's not. So we really wanted to open up the black box and see what was inside and what's going on inside that complicated machine. That was really our thing. And I still, I still basically am driven by that, uh, at least in an Oracle context. That's really still what I want to show people, right? Like what's going on in their database. Um, Interesting. Uh, so so we're, we're about at the top of the hour. Um, I, I did have a question about uh, your feelings about uh, the role of artificial intelligence and chat GPT and how these things might uh, shape the future. And I don't know if Rob had any final questions. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to keep you too long. Uh, being, yeah, uh, no, I have time actually, because the meeting I had a conflict with actually got rescheduled, not because of this, but it just fortuitously so i can stay on now as far as the chat gpt stuff goes i've really you know kind of stayed pretty far away from that stuff mm -hmm. i find it a little bit creepy and um and says you know a, i'm not really i mean there's so much garbage on the internet i mean if you got trained on the internet garbage i don't know if i really want to talk to you right so you know that's sort of my feeling about it now but others i mean friends of mine kyle you know kyle haley right he's gone all in on uh, on ai stuff and and uh, i haven't i haven't talked to him a lot about it but he's he's basically you know you know all in on ai stuff at least he seems to be so that's you know people are into it now i did get interested when i was away from oracle and, and uh you know trying to peddle my 20 years of experience. Uh, I got very interested in blockchain. You know, that was like 2007 and stuff. So I spent a bunch of time reading blockchain white papers and trying to sort of understand some of these technologies. And I still find that space pretty interesting, but it's really gonna take a while, I think, before it kind of, before the really practical application surface, there's so much froth about NFTs and ICOs and all these other gimmicks. Um, we'll see, you know, but I think blockchain technology is kind of, like, but the AI stuff kind of gives me the creeps. On the one hand, it gives me the creeps. And on the other hand, it scares me. Uh, well, it's, it's just not, creepy you know. scare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about it just because I know it's going to creep into all our lives in all kinds mm -hmm. of ways that we may or may not really know about, right? Like, you know, and then, you know, the other thing that I find ridiculous, not ridiculous, but, you know, these things supposedly are based on, you know, at the root, they're just trying to do word prediction, right? In this super fancy, you know, ultra sophisticated mm -hmm. way, right? I'm like, well, you know, if, if they're so damn smart, why can't they get autocorrect right? Right? It's still it's still totally screwed up, right? Every time I, you know, it's I, it still does, you know, it still makes me misspell as many things as it helps me spell right, you know. I mean, it's like, geez, a whiz, man. You my know. my favorite autocorrect story is I was uh, on my phone, and I'm going, and I said 
tongue planted firmly in cheek. And it, it auto-corrected the thong, which completely <laughs> changed go. the whole meaning of what I was saying. <laughs> Did that one get you in trouble too, Rob? That's a uh, no, fortunately, it was to a friend. Uh, <laughs> it, and, yeah, you know, you mentioned... Uh, tools like chat GPT, they're basically learning off the internet. Um, they're, uh, and I've studied data poisoning and AI. You can trick AI to do all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. But if a teenager writes a sci-fi that includes a technology that doesn't exist and it trains itself off of this fiction, that fiction, it, it doesn't know if it's true or false, okay? <laughs> that fiction can make it into your output from a, a chat GPT like tool. Yeah. And I mean, they say it hallucinates, right? So it can just it does. make stuff up. It can make stuff up. Yeah, it hallucinates yeah. these things. You know, it, it read something <laughs> somewhere about uh, Star Trek transporters. <laughs> you know yeah. and the technology behind it you know? now i think that you know i think that those kind of models those large language models that are trained on very specifically curated corpuses that are designed to you know provide the best possible information about some domain of expertise mm -hmm. that the, i'm sure that i mean i know people are doing that too right those things could be very useful and very powerful, right? And I guess they're, yes. they're now using these things to kind of do protein discovery or something like in the drug in the drug research areas, I guess, mm -hmm. can be useful. So yeah, I'm not saying that, but I still think they're kind of scary. And I think that, you know, here's the thing, if it's governments or corporations that are in charge of steering the thing, it ain't going to work well. It ain't going to end up well. No, it's governments not. are all about annihilating each other and being on top of each other and corporations are all about whatever gets money right and we've seen where social media goes and even you know quote unquote unregulated news right you know propaganda oh. news so i'm not too thrilled about it if if it's if it's basically in the hands of governments or corporations it seems like it's it's not going to work i mean they don't have who's a good gonna, track record for, who, for freedom. <laughs> who's going to keep bad actors from making AI-driven weapons, right? And that basically, you know, annihilate who knows who, right? So. I think it was in 2007. I probably have the year wrong. Uh, Vladimir Putin said, whoever masters AI first will rule the world. Mm, that's interesting. So, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Probably uh, right, you. though, yeah. So, you know, we have China that's pushing AI. We got, you know, let's just say the United States, Silicon Valley, uh, DARPA pushing AI. And they have some interesting um, things out there, you know, <laughs> fascinating technically. I am glad I'm near the end of my career because just trying to keep up with yeah. the pace of change. You know, I've always had a rule. I spend an hour every morning studying just to stay current. You know, am I going to have to up it to two hours just to stay relevant? Right, right, yeah. I mean, in that regard, I'm pretty lucky. You know, I I latched on to SQL and relational databases just when they were kind of, you know, starting to grab hold. And it's been pretty much my whole career. So I haven't had to really... I mean, it's 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 been uh, you know a lot of different jobs, but you know, kind of SQL. Once SQL was part of it, that was your really kind of uh, you know understanding you know core database concepts and how to write SQL. You know, pretty much um, was a kind of a job guarantee. I think during during my career. I mean, mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah, that's uh, similar to me because I, I first started using Oracle in version four. In oh wow <laughs> you got me deep yeah i've been uh been using it ever and it's you know i still learn things uh, so some you know you might think that well that's an awful long time to be using a single product you know oracle 
but uh, I'm learning things, you know, every day about the product and the data and the performance. And oh, yeah. I mean, things have changed. I, there's so much about, you know, the new sequel that I have no clue about. I mean, uh, you know, match recognize and things like that. I, they're super useful, but I don't know if I have the brains, the brain cells to master them, you know. <laughs> but a lot of things. I mean, the analytic functions are very powerful. I'm I'm doing a lot of work with the analytic functions um, in, in you know, sort of now. Um, lots of things you can do that just would have been. Yeah, I used to I used to lag function to, to generate the deltas from some of the performance metrics that are exactly cumulative. yeah yeah that's my big thing <laughs> lag is good lag is good so here's so you use lag not lead yeah so well, here's the thing so here's the thing i use lag too right because you know basically you want to you want to compare a reading with its predecessor in time right so that's like a lag function right <laughs> But there's a whole sort of other way of looking at it where, you know, all yeah. you have to do is change ascending to descending or vice versa. And then you got to use the lead function. And we have a couple of engineers that always do the delta using the lead function. When I read their code, it's like inscrutable to me. I'm like, I can't read it. It's got to be. Well, one, one of the interesting things that I did, at least for me anyway, was um, um, generating uh, SQL arrival times with the lead function from ash data. Ah. So, so basically, I could see, you know, the actual queuing of that SQL statement, and act, and also compare that to, and graph it together uh, with how long it took that query to execute. So if your SQL arrival time is less than your query execute time, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> but if your SQL arrival time is faster than your query execute time, then you start getting bottlenecks, and it's, it's just, it was just, a, it was an interesting exercise. Anyway, I haven't, haven't done that much more. So were you like uh, doing lead and lag within sessions? Yeah, just to, well ask, because you within have, sessions tracking because back? you have SQL execution ID, right? You can take. Oh yeah, right. And right you can yeah. find find the individual execution of a SQL statement and uh, and predict when the the next. Uh, well, not predict, but you can show when the the next execution of that. Um, SQL statement occurred, and then you can uh, generate a time series uh, graph of the of that uh, the duration or how many seconds it was or until the next execution of the query. Right. So that SQL exec idea is kind of interesting. Uh, I had a sort of an exchange with Tanel a couple of years ago about that because um, he sort of decoded it and uh, mm -hmm. put you know but basically it, it captures the execution counter for the sql id mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> and so you can use that to estimate uh average latencies and detect shifts in average latencies of very high frequency sequels like on a very busy OLTP system right where something might you know have very you know tight response time windows you know sequels have to execute within 10 milliseconds or you know every you know, or things will start slow down right so how do you kind of detect so here's what you do you know we use ash data to estimate db time by just counting samples right every sample in ash counts for a second more or less of db time mm -hmm. and the execution counter for a very high volume sql that's you know executing all the time you know you'll sample sessions with that sql id right and they'll so you'll have a lot of samples with the execution id for the same sql id mm -hmm. so those are counter values right so let's say over a 10 second period I can say I saw this SQL ID a hundred times and the minimum exec ID was X and the maximum exec ID was Y. Well, that means in those 10 seconds, Y minus X executions happened at least that many, right? Because that's how much the execution counter changed over the, over the 10 seconds, right? Well, now you also have a number of ash samples and you add them up and you say, well, here's the total amount of DB time. And then here's a good estimate of the executions. So I divide DB time by executions and that's average latency, right? So you can actually detect 
you can estimate average latencies for very high volume SQLs, you know, on a pretty fine grained basis, you know, every 10 seconds, if it's executing enough times that I get, you know, a sufficient number of samples in ASH to do some of these things. Um, now, is it going to give you the exact latency? I don't think so. It's an estimate. But if you track it and it goes like this, you got a problem. So, yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. that's actually uh, something I'm, you know, I've been meaning to want to sort of try and do for people, either maybe an EM metric extension or something like that. But, um, you know, you can just siphon off of the front end of ASH, which is a very efficient thing to query. You know, you query a minute worth of ASH data, it costs you nothing, right? Because ASH is queried, you know, from the most recent back, you know. So if you query, mm -hmm. you know, a minute of ASH, you're just basically starting, you know, and, and going through the buffer for a minute worth of data. It's like zero, you know, it's like nothing. Uh, so you could do like real-time monitoring, I think, you know, in, 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 in pseudo real-time. I mean, Interesting. Nothing's really real-time, you know. Anyway, that was an idea. I actually have a patent application for that, but I don't know if it'll, <laughs> if it'll get granted. But I thought it was a, a neat idea. Anyway, right. you guys have any other pressing questions? Or I enjoyed this a lot. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. By the way, so I do have a question. Yes, sir. How do you make a surfboard? How do you make one? Or or a boogie well, board. A boogie board. Well, I've actually been, you know, geez, man, I should have had some of my boards up here. I could show you. But no, I mean, I started out. So, you know, I started out uh, just with like flat plywood in, in a certain kind of shape that I, you know, there's guys on the Internet that, that do various things. But in traditional Hawaiian uh, surf culture, they've always had this uh, this kind of wooden belly board that's called a pipo and so i started out by and i have a good friend from hawaii he's my my best college friend and so he would always send me sort of pipo info and stuff and so i i started getting interested in sort of making my own sort of quote unquote pipos so i have a few board you know boards that are made just out of wood and they start out as like flat plywood and then some other things but then now what i do is i have uh i use a a quarter I use a quarter inch plywood so it's pretty thin mm -hmm. uh, and then I carve the 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 shape out of that and then um, I put carbon fiber on I put a, a layer of carbon fiber on that and that gives it enough stiffness so that it won't snap in mm -hmm. half and then on that I glue foam and that's kind of my homemade my homemade bodyboard design and they actually work pretty good i'm very i'm very proud of the and that design evolved over like i think i made like 10 or 12 and i finally kind of zeroed in on this mm -hmm. on this design of uh you know thin plywood reinforced with uh carbon fiber layer and then uh, and then uh, glue uh, uh foam on top of that mm -hmm. and, and then anyway. fiberglass involved What's that they use fiberglass on the outside or yeah, so most surfboards, I was just describing my my own like homemade bodyboard designs. But yeah, a regular surfboard will have like, uh, you know, like a styrofoam or other kind of foam core uh, that gets shaped very carefully. So the whole thing is about the shape, right? The volume mm -hmm. and the shape, you know, there's all, there's infinite. I mean, you see these guys that are just sort of sanding this big piece of uh, styrofoam. You're like, what's that all about, right? But there's all this very delicate shaping that they do. And then once the styrofoam blank is just the right shape, then they fiberglass around that, uh, you know, a couple layers of, of fiberglass or sometimes carbon fiber, you know, uh, I guess. I'm not a big, I don't know that much about surfboard, regular surfboard construction because I don't surf, I don't surf on those. But yeah, I love surfing on my surf. homemade. I love bodyboarding on my homemade thing because it's just a lot more fun to ride your own equipment kind of thing. Yeah, I broke a couple of fiberglass surfboards. So, uh oh, have you surfed? Uh, North Shore. Oh, really? Where? Pipeline? No. Yeah, I did pipeline once. I did it once and I damn near killed myself. So. <laughs> 
So, so now if I get a bug up my butt, um, we have a house in Delaware. Oh, and I'll, okay. go to, I'll go to Rehoboth Beach and I'll do the nice, gentle two foot uh, waves and going, I'm surfing again. Not during hurricane season, though. Oh, God, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm 63 years old and I learned I just do not bounce as well as I used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm from Delaware, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, I grew up in Wilmington. All right. My my wife was born in Wilmington. Really? Yeah. Small world. Where'd she go to school? <laughs> Delaware. I don't know. No, I meant high school. <laughs> I have no idea. I could oh, ask her. No. I could funny. ask. Uh, I could ask her. Um, you know, what's she her tells name? me. If, what's her name? I'll tell you whether she was in my class at Concord. <laughs> um, what was her maiden name? Uh, her maiden name is Dayton, but okay, her family is Hazen. Hazen. Okay. Hazen. And yeah, there's a Hazen know. road up there, whole area that was full of Hazens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was on her mama's side was a Hazen. Yeah. It's nice there. I mean, mid-Atlantic. I, I, I like California a lot, but you know, mm -hmm. I really, I miss the springtime that, that they get back East, you know, when everything just busts out, you know? Oh yeah. We have all at season. once, you know, all the flowers and trees. I love that. Yeah. We're still having an early uh, spring. It's still, you know, a little chilly here, yeah. uh, but nice. I, you know, I love the East coast. You know, I've tried, you know, I'd love to try San Diego. I have a, my nephew is a cop in San Diego, but the weather there is just tedious. It never changes. Yeah. You know, and. Yeah, like, it's nice all the time, which isn't so nice as it turns out. Right? Yeah. It, it, my, my nephew describes it as tedious. Tedious. <laughs> I had a friend who did windsurfing. He was big into windsurfing. And whenever he heard the words on the weather reports, uh, gale force winds or a small craft <laughs> advisory, then he would uh, drive out. Surf to day. Windsurfer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last Friday, uh, my wife and uh, one of her friends, we took the boat into the inner harbor for happy hour. And it was a small craft advisory. I have a Boston whaler. And going into the inner harbor, it was easy. The, the wind was at our back. <laughs> Coming back was hilarious because fortunately, I'm behind the console. They were both sitting in front of the console. And, you know, I've got water coming over the bow. And, you know, I'm like going, guys, you're the ones who wanted to go out. <laughs> so, Not a sailboat, motorboat. No, Power motorboat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, center console, Boston Whaler. That's a 20 foot Boston whaler. It is the perfect bay boat. I use not much room to hide from spray though. No, no, I was <laughs> soaked. So was my wife and her friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey Roger, I'd be happy I, 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 I have to investigate your anomaly detection stuff. I haven't I haven't seen that. So I'll, okay, yeah, I'll send you some uh, some send stuff. Me some pointers, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, good to get to know you and um, appreciate your coming on to uh, Graybeards. And thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. All right, guys, are we going to end it? All right, John. Thank you for joining us. All right. Yeah. Take care. See you. Bye bye, guys. Bye. Bye.